whakapua ki ngā te tatau, te tatau o te mātauranga o ngā whakaaro here ai te tangi a te pipi wharauroa, kui, kui, fiti, fiti ora, kui, kui, ki a rangi e tū nei, kui, kui, ki a papatua nuku e tapoto nei, tū mai ihi, tū mai wana, rere ki te puna o te pipi wharauroa, ko tāne tukua, ko tāne hurohia, ki a rongo ai koe ki te tangi a te mānu nei. Kui, kui, fiti, fiti ora ki te whaio ki te o mārama, ti hei mauri ora. Tēnā koutou e tū hono mai ki tēnei hui ipurangi mai i te whānuitanga o te mutu o te ao. Ko te reo kāranga, ko te reo rāhiri tēnei o te runga o ngaitahu. Ai, ka tika ki te mihi atu ki ngā mate o te wā, a ki ngā tūpuna kua whetu rangitia nei tēnei. Koutou i tēnei wā. O kua ki mai i te kāinga tūturu, i te moinga, o te mano, o te tini, āpiti hono, tātai hono, rātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou. E ngā kā nohi ora, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. E te iwi, welcome to our settlement lecture this month. I'm very excited with this particular lecture, but before talking about this lecture, I'd like to um, recap uh, on uh, the previous lecture on fisheries uh, that was held online and in person. Uh, you'll remember both uh, Sir Tipini O'Regan, uh, David Higgins and Craig Allison presented to us. We received a lot of positive feedback uh, on that lecture, and for me that lecture fulfilled uh, some of the purposes of this whole entire lecture series, um, that purpose being not to forget our past, to retain our tribal, institutional and intergenerational memory, and indeed to uh, not forget and to continue, to continue the fight uh, for Ngaitahu Rangatira Tanga uh, within our Ngaitahu Takiwa. Uh, let me now just briefly talk about the um, series that Dr Martin Fisher is to present. It's uh, indeed uh, close to my heart and I had a look at Martin's presentation and there were three things uh, that struck me. First, uh, the many faces in there that hopefully some of you will recognise either being your uh, co-mata, your poa, your toa, your aunts and uncles and what have you. There's a lovely uh, photo in Wellington, I think it's at the third reading, where uh, Ngai Tahu uh, assembled en masse uh, for the third reading of our settlement. Uh, the second one uh, that struck me when reading this through was the, uh, uh, the fight and the negotiations that took place uh, over those many years ago and to rem be reminded of some of the detail uh, around those negotiations and it brought back a flood of memories um, when I uh, looked at Martin's presentation. And the final part of Martin's presentation that struck me was the components of the, uh, our deed of settlement with the Crown and uh, it was good to see Martin's perspective on what are the various components or what we call the bolt-ons to our Ngaitahu deed of settlement. So look, it's with much pleasure now I introduce uh, Martin, who you all know and has presented the previous lectures to us. So, uh, kia whai kororia, i hoa i runga raua, ki mouta ronga ki te whenua, aroha nui ki ngā tangata katoa, e te rangatira ngā mihi kia koe. Kia ora tātou. Kia ora. Oh, thank you so much, Raka here. Um, today's lecture on the Ngaitaho Settlement um, looking at the negotiations as well as the, the overview of the contents of the settlement uh, is something that, you know, is particularly uh, interesting to me. We look at some of that history, uh, but when it comes to the actual settlement negotiations, uh, I guess it's something that's perhaps a little bit more tangible uh, because it was something uh, more recently. And, you know, it gives me great, great pleasure to be able to uh, present about this very precedent-setting settlement, you know, for the nation. Um, obviously, it's importance to Ngai Tahu Whanui as well. But the way that other settlements have come uh, since then 
uh, shows the importance of the Ngāi settlement and that long intergenerational fight, which you know, we, we've detailed in, in previous lecture series, and the fisheries settlement as well, and, and we'll see some of the precedents uh, and influences that, that were established there as well. So we will, in the first half today, we will go through uh, some of the overview of the negotiations, the different negotiating teams on behalf of Naitahu, uh, but also looking at the Crown. These negotiations and the settlement are really important to try and understand uh, Te Karauna, understand the many different viewpoints that exist within the Crown and the way that it formulates um, its its decisions uh, and the way that it wants to um, perhaps advance its own purposes even within something like a treaty settlement. And so we'll look at those negotiating teams and just an overview of a little bit of the timeline of the negotiations. Uh, and we'll try and do that, I'll, I'll try and do that in some uh, summary form. And then we'll break and have a, uh, a bit of a corridor amongst yourselves. And in the second half, we'll look at the actual contents of the settlement itself. Uh, as Raki here mentioned, some of those bolt-ons, some of those different um, pieces which added up you know, to the second longest legal document in New Zealand's history. It's very difficult to cover it uh, in its entirety, uh, but we'll do our best to, to cover at least those really main portions of the settlement. Now, negotiations begin in 1991. They break down in late 1994. We have a litigation period, which we'll also touch upon. Uh, and then negotiations recommence uh, in sort of April uh, to June 1996 uh, with the passage of the Terunanga Onaitahu Act. Things move really quickly after that, from 96 um, through to a heads of agreement before the election, deed of settlement uh, a little bit over a year later, and then settlement legislation being passed in 1998. It seems like a short amount of time, but as we've looked uh, in this lecture series, and I'm sure as many of you um, know at home, um, at Mahi, Anaitahu Fanui, this long intergenerational struggle, this is just the last um, part of that long journey. So let's have a look at the negotiating teams for Naitahu uh, to begin with. The challenge of fighting the crown is enormous. The crown likes to say that it doesn't have all the access to all the resources available to it. And, and look, in the early days um, of treaty settlement negotiations, that was certainly the case. But as we'll see, the Crown negotiating team is, is a behemoth. It's a true monster. And we'll see it has many different heads, um, many different arms doing the mahi. And so it's important for negotiating groups on the claimant side, and for Naitahu, certainly, you had to get the best advisors, the best help, and of course, the hands of hundreds, if not thousands, of Naitahu Whanui as well contributing. The different negotiating teams, as we can see, were formally split into this A team, B team, and C team. But there could be certainly uh, some overlaps, certainly between the B team and the C team. Uh, but even in the A team, uh, with I know uh, Charlie Crofts often uh, having some mahi as well within the B team to, to show um, some unity between those different groups. Now, the A team were the principals. Tatipini O'Regan and Rakahia Tau Sr. being the co-negotiators. Kuo Langsbury, Charles Crofts, who I mentioned previously, uh, Edward Ellison, and Trevor House. Now, later in the negotiations, um, Rakahia, uh, who we just heard from, 
uh, replace his father in the negotiations, and as well as Gabriel Huria uh, had a role in the A-team as well later in the negotiations. So you can see it's not always going to remain static. There's a whole lot of different moving pieces occurring. And the principals were meant to be involved with their fellow principals on the other side from the crown, the most high level of the negotiation. Obviously, the details would come in as well, uh, but these principals in the A-team were meant to, to represent that sort of high-level negotiation. Helping the A-team with some of the more detailed aspects, but not to the fine detail as we'll see in the C-team, uh, was the B-team. And you had Sid Ashton, longtime secretary of the Naitahumati Trust Board, inaugural uh, CEO of Tirunanga o Naitahu as well, uh, Sid Ashton Opakeha, uh, had been fighting with Naitahu for many, many decades. Anaki Goodall was a claims manager. In many ways, he was almost uh, a, a principal negotiator late in the piece um, because the B-team level for the Crown as well um, was so involved in, in that sort of 1996 period. And then you had very important legal and financial advisors. As I mentioned, the crown is coming with its own resources, its own massive capacity. And so you need to match the crown. Negotiations are not cheap. But if they are done well, certainly the payoff is, is more than adequate. Nick Davidson was a key legal advisor for Naitahu. He took over from Paul Temp. It was QC that was um, Naitahu's main lawyer for the Naitahu tribunal hearings. And Nick Davidson uh, was also involved in the C team. We can see some of that overlap. Financial advisors, also incredibly important. The treasury benches are very adequately filled. And so what you often have is people who had formerly been in treasury uh, who became financial advisors. This is the best way. You need to know the inside uh, thinking of your enemy to be able to adequately address and face this enemy when it comes to these negotiations. And so Stephen Jennings was one of those. He has worked in the Treasury in the late 1980s during the big privatizations that were going on. And so he was a key figure to have, although he only remained uh, for a short time. He was later uh, replaced and initially helped by Richard Mead, who was a more than adequate uh, financial advisor and certainly helped in filling some of the gap left by Stephen Jennings. Now, finally, you've got the C team. And we can see in these images, we've got the A team on the left, uh, and we've got the C team made up of some of those same B team uh, members as well. In there, we've got Anake on the top left, uh, to his right, Richard Mead, and in the bottom right, we've got Nick Davidson, and to his left, Sid Ashton. So you can see some of that overlap that was occurring. Professor Tamadi To was a key part of the C team in charge of the apology and the historical account. You had a number of different people working on cultural redress, Diane Krangel, Justin Inns, Jan West, Sandra Cook especially, very strongly involved, uh, and Tony Sewell involved in property. But I just want to note that there were many others. I can only, you know, list these main sort of names here, but it's really important to recognize the hundreds, if not thousands of people involved on the ground, involved in the kitchens, involved on the road, driving people, making sure they're booking the things for people, the administrative staff around it, so I, I, I want to emphasize that, that, that it's, you know, we, we put these kind of big names, so to speak, up here, um, but recognizing, you know, the village that is necessary uh, to push Tekereme forward into the settlement needs to be recognized. So let's turn now to the Crown negotiating team. We can see there, it's really difficult to find a normal photo of Douglas Graham. And certainly this is 
quite a pose that he's striking there. Douglas Graham was the Minister of Treaty Negotiations and was the key principal on behalf of the Crown. Prime Minister Jim Bolger also had an incredibly important role to play uh, and Minister of Fisheries and Māori Affairs, Doug Kidd. Uh, Dennis Marshall was the Minister of Conservation for a key period. You certainly had Ruth Richardson as Minister of Finance in the early period. Not so helpful, uh, certainly not to the Crown or to Naitahu, I would say. Um, she was replaced by Bill Birch after the 1993 election. So the ministerial group, and as well as some of the secretaries of the specific government departments, such as the Secretary of the Ministry of Justice, the secretaries are essentially CEOs. They're like the CEOs of their departments. And these had huge roles to play. Now, while you have the Minister of Treaty Negotiations, you have many other different ministries and departments also involved. And you can see I've listed in there. The Treaty of Waitangi Policy Unit became known as the Office of Treaty Settlements from 1995. This was the main unit involved in the negotiations. Although they were leading the negotiations, you can't say that they were the most powerful or had the most sway. Doug Graham was incredibly powerful within the cabinet. He had a strong ally in the Prime Minister, Jim Bolger, but the Treasury, the Minister of Finance, the two ministers which I've mentioned previously, possibly the most powerful within these negotiations. And so you can see how important it is to have those financial advisors on the other side. The Crown Law Office, not far from Treasury, the Attorney General, incredibly important, held a lot of sway. And perhaps the third most important was the Department of Conservation. Conservation lands and issues with third party interests and conservationists generally, inside government, outside government, was a huge challenge for Naitahu, perhaps more so than any other settlement that has been negotiated. The extent of opposition was massive. This might not be the case today, in the last 15, 20 settlements to go, or in the last decade. But in these early years, when it was not clear what kind of redress was going to be negotiated, Treasury, the Crown Law Office, and the Department of Conservation was quite a trifecta. But you had a whole lot of other government departments involved. I've mentioned Jim Bolger and the Prime Minister, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, very important late in the negotiations. Tepuni Kokiri, it was known as Manatu Māori initially during the negotiations as it was switching from the Department of Māori Affairs into Tepuni Kokiri. Also had a very strong role, not always positive in terms of Naitahu interests. You might think that the Minister of Māori Development would be the greatest ally for Naitahu, but it's always important to remember that they are the crown. And so there were some helpful aspects, but certainly could hold some sway and later in the negotiations was certainly much more helpful. Ministry of Commerce strongly involved in Ponamu licensing. Ministry of Fisheries, for other reasons, we've talked about the fishery settlement in last month's workshop and doesn't exist anymore, but the Dep Department of Survey Lands and Information was really important. It had the information on the lands that were going to be transferred. Over all of this was cabinet, right? Cabinet is what would have to approve or uh, negate any decisions that were to be made. And so you had to get cabinet support. And that's why I show that cabinet in the bottom there. But hopefully looking at all these different government departments will kind of bust that myth that the crown is a monolith, right? That it has this one point of view. It's not the case at all. It's getting pulled in a whole bunch of different directions. Sometimes it's chopping off its own sort of arms, growing another arm. Different pieces of this monster are disagreeing with each other. And so it's important to think about that in terms of the future, using that for Naitahu's own advantage.
showing the different um, departments to be grappled with, the different ministerial responsibilities. So if we break away from looking at Tekarona as this monolith, I think it becomes a lot more helpful. And we break it down and, and show the ways that the crown really battles itself sometimes. And this can be to the benefit, perhaps, of Naitahu and could be at times in these negotiations. So we've got our negotiating team set out. Let's turn to an overview of the negotiation process. I couldn't find a photo of these large meetings which took place, and so I actually had to get this still out of a video um, from Fakat, uh, Te Taunga, uh, the Naitahu website. There's a short video which I highly recommend you watch, a little news clip. And this image here shows what some of the early negotiations, really the first three years from 1991 to 1994, were like. A huge table. Principals and advisors set out. Media present. It's slightly insane if you think about it. The ways in which it was kind of Publicly, I mean, I don't think they would stay in there for the entire meeting, but these huge, huge meetings taking place, right? Enormous amount of people. The issues with Naitahu from the get-go were just enormous. Nearly every single type of claim filed in the Waitangi Tribunal was a part of the Naitahu settlement, except for Raupatu, for confiscation, military confiscation, which occurred in the North Island, and claims to geothermal resources. Everything else was there. And you can see that, the first minutes of these meetings which took place, 20, 25 pages from the Crown, which is always very succinct. They don't put any detail in there. And it was just issue after issue after issue. And it just shows the breadth of these claims that were to be tackled. And it reveals those challenges that, that were going to uh, present themselves, you know, to both negotiating parties, but certainly more so to Naitahu. Now, you could say that the negotiations officially begin at the end of the Waitangi Tribunal hearings, which we've discussed in previous workshop. You have the establishment of the Naitahu Land Bank at the end of these hearings. Uh, both Rakahia Tau Sr. and Tatipani O'Regan approach uh, Judge Ashley McHugh, who was the presiding officer for the Naitahu Inquiry, saying, there's a lot of privatizing going on and we need to do something to protect the Naitahu asset base because once we settle, there's not going to be anything left. This was the first land bank established by a long, long shot. Waikato Tainui, which is negotiating at the same time as Naitahu in these early 1990s, doesn't receive its land bank until 1993. And Naitahu's land bank was very unique because the Naitahu Rohe is more than half of the, the country, most of the South Island. Huge amount of lands available. So Naitahu was able to do something pretty amazing. It was able to add properties into the land bank and on-sell them, sometimes within days, for a profit. And this was used to fund Naitahu's negotiations. Those legal and financial advisors I showed previously, not cheap. And so this was a huge, huge asset, this land banking system. We get the main Naitahu Tribunal report released in February 1991. We've talked about some of that uh, two workshops ago. And the Crown takes a good eight months to figure out what's going on in this 1,300 plus page report. And I've seen the files from within the Crown, all the different government departments trying to figure out what is relevant to them, what is gonna happen, what will have to be done to address these issues? And so you had quite a decent chunk of that period, and certainly for Naitahu as well. And as we've discussed previously, both the Crown and Naitahu did not agree with all of the contents of the settlement. Uh, sorry, the contents of the tribunal report. But they agreed to set aside their differences and to move forward 
The negotiations actually got off to a really quick start, despite these myriad issues which I've mentioned that were going to have to be tackled. Very early on, Naitahu was pushed by the Crown to make a proposal for what it perceived the financial aspects of its settlement should be, what should be the size of its financial redress, the compensation. This put Naitahu in an incredibly difficult position. The crown, as we can see, is going into this process completely ad hoc, right? It doesn't know what it's doing. In many ways, Naitahu, as well as Waikato Tainui in some ways, but much more so Naitahu, were helping the crown develop its own treaty settlement proposals. The crown would essentially say, well, what do you think we should do with this? And Naita would have to think of some kind of proposal, whether it was Ponamu, whether it was high country stations, whether it was this financial redress. Now, you might say this could be of something beneficial to Naita, but it also puts Naita in a really tough position, especially when it came to this financial redress. They had to provide some kind of a proposal. It couldn't be too small. That would be absurd. It had to be relatively large. They knew that there would be counter proposals and the Crown would claim that this was not a Dutch auction that was going on, but it was. One side would have to propose something, the other side would come back. And so Naitahu had to present a well-considered proposal. And what they arrived on was focusing on the principle of tenths. We've talked about the importance of tenths when it came to the Otago purchase. And this principle was applied for other purchases and the entire Naitahu claim. This idea that if one tenth of the land had been reserved to Naitahu, perhaps they wouldn't be there negotiating. On this principle, they got a valuation of the entire Naitahu Rohe, all of the lands. How much were they worth? They got the most basic valuation known as a prairie value. This is a valuation of the land without any improvements, without anything being done to it. And they got this conservative estimate of $13 billion in 1991. So they divided that by 10, $1.3 billion. And this to Naitahu was a fair undervaluation of what potentially could have been owed. Nowhere near the true losses into the tens of billions. Low tens, but from Naitahu estimates, from the Crown's own valuations, the losses were massive. Now, Naitahu knew they couldn't get dollar for dollar compensation, especially at that time. It's a terrible economic position that the Crown is in. This $1.3 billion settlement based on tenths based on key principles, on actual facts on the ground, rejected by the Crown. They never even respond to the written offer, only rejecting it in their monthly meetings. The Crown countered with $100 million, a, a figure completely pulled out of thin air by Treasury. This was incredibly insulting for the Naitahu team. Zero rationalization. Now, for the Crown, they'd never offered that much money before. $20 million had been offered to Wakaro Tainui uh, by the fourth Labour government in 1990. So within a couple years, jumping to $100 million, to the Crown, might have perceived this as generous, but Naitahu could not accept it. Now, later in February, Naitahu actually countered with less than half of the original amount about $560 million. This, the crown would be able to pay off over a number of years. It wouldn't have to come out all at once. It could set the amount of payments that were going to be made to the OECD average, the, how, not, uh, how New Zealand's GDP is in comparison to other OECD countries. You could see, trying to appeal to Treasury, but this was not accepted. Here we see the beginning of the breakdown of the negotiations. Now in June 1992, we have a different settlement proposal being presented from within the Crown by the Treaty of Waitangi Policy Unit. 
$200 million. But this cabinet paper never makes it through cabinet. They're rejected by Treasury. But it's something important to recognize. Would a $200 million settlement have been accepted? Certainly open to debate. Now, during this gradual breakdown of these negotiations, we see little bits of advancements. The high country stations are added to the land bank, Greenstone, Routeburn, and Elfin Bay. As we'll see, these entire stations do not survive, mainly due to the influence of these conservationists within and outside of government. But really, the Crown is finally developing its own policies, and during this time, Naitahu is incredibly frustrated. Negotiation after negotiation is going nowhere. Eventually, in the end of 1994, as Wakaro Tainui is set to settle only the Raupatu claims, separating out everything else, it's clear that the Crown is more focused on that, even though they deny that in correspondence and in face-to-face -face meetings. An interim settlement offer is presented to Naitahu in November 1994. It's incredibly limited. Rarotoka Island, but with a marginal strip, a queen's chain around the end, $10 million of land bank properties, and Tutaipatsu Lagoon are offered. But this is rejected by the iwi and certainly by the Naitahu negotiating group. Full breakdown of the negotiations occurs. And so we move into the litigation period of these negotiations, an, eff an effective complete breakdown. Rather than meeting face to face, they are now meeting in the courtroom. And you can see a whole range of litigation there from Naitahu. It wasn't cheap. Litigation is quite expensive. But the purpose of this was to force the Crown into an uncomfortable position. Not every single one of these lawsuits you know, was a victory for Naitahu, but the pressure. There's nothing more that the Crown desires than certainty. It wants financial certainty. It wants legal certainty. It wants to be able to predict what is happening tomorrow at all times. When you introduce litigation, this is when things become uncertain for the Crown. The Crown is now squirming in its seat. And so in that sense, this litigation process was incredibly successful. Wakaro Tainui had settled at this time. Really, the $170 million precedent it had gone into place through the fisheries settlement after this whole quantification of loss that I just mentioned, this February 1992. Fisheries settlement is in September 1992. So perhaps the financial redress wasn't able to be moved too much, although we'll see there were many bolt-ons, and I'll discuss those shortly. But these different pieces of litigation against the Minister of Conservation in relation uh, to whale watching permits, Land Corp for not showing, uh, allowing Naitahu to see enough different farms that were available, Coal Corp to stop a new coal exporting project on the West Coast, Ministry of Commerce regarding Ponama. And then we have lawsuits against the Waitangi Tribunal. You might be slightly surprised by that. But as we discussed a couple months ago, the Waitangi Tribunal has remedial powers where, in theory, it can force the Crown to return certain lands and financial compensation. And with the negotiations broken down and with a tribunal report in hand, it made sense to not only go through the High Court and the Court of Appeal, but also back to the Waitangi Tribunal. Now this attempt to have remedies awarded in the tribunal was unsuccessful, but it was a part of the strategy involved in this litigation. And it was quite controversial. The remedies applications were meant to be presided over by Judge Ashley McHugh, who was the presiding officer for the Naitaho Inquiry. At the last second, he was kicked out, and it was taken over by the then chief judge, Eddie Dury. Eddie Dury 
basically rejected the application, saying that Naitahu had taken up too much of the tribunal's time and that there wasn't adequate funding to address these kinds of issues. There was accusations made of collusion between different branches of government by the judiciary and the executive that Eddie Dury and Doug Graham were essentially in cahoots. It was so controversial that the litigation was held in camera, that is, inside the judge's chambers and not publicly. I guess we'll find out in the coming decades, once some of the files are unsealed from the Crown side and from the court side, what was really going on. But we can see some huge issues potentially arising. Perhaps the Crown's treaty settlements would completely have stopped if it had gone forward. But it was important for Naitahu to push every single avenue available. Now, this couldn't go on forever. Nakahiyo Tao Sr. was actually a huge advocate of the litigation strategy. He wanted it to push forward. He thought there couldn't be anything achieved through negotiations with the Crown. They just, you couldn't be trusted. But there was also some push from within the iwi, and not from within the negotiating group, from the Naitahu Fanui. Naitahu was viewed as somewhat of a guinea pig, uh, within the Crown even, and outside. Right, Naitahu was put into these positions. Give us your proposals. Tell us what you want. No, you can't have that. You can't have that. You know, Naitahu had been very patient, and so there was some sympathy within the crown. The $170 million precedent had been set, but there were many other issues that were available on the table. And although Waikato Tainui had settled in late 94 and 95, there was huge backlash to the Crown's treaty settlement proposals, the fiscal envelope proposals. The summer of 94 to 95 was pretty insane. There was huge, huge protests taking place. Categorical rejection of the Crown's treaty settlement policies, even by Waikato Tainui that had just settled, and certainly by Naitahu. So this background meant that Naitahu could possibly be in this more positive position. It was made clear that the negotiations would not recommence until the passage of the Terunaga o Naitahu bill. We're going to get into that next month in, in the following workshop series. We're going to go into some detail about the negotiations and, and the issues internally as well over the establishment of Terunaga o Naitahu. But it got its third reading in April 96, and things start to move. June 1996, the Crown says, no way we're giving you an interim settlement. Only final. Two days later, they change their minds. Return of Ponamu is promised. Tutaipatu Lagoon. Rarotoka Island without a marginal strip. And $10 million, even if the negotiations break down, to be kept by Naitahu. A very attractive interim settlement. The election is coming up, our first MMP election. Who even knows if treaty settlements will advance? You know, will New Zealand first, will ACT be involved? What's going to happen? Just before the election, heads of agreement, otherwise known as agreement in principle these days and many other negotiations, signed. A deed of settlement negotiated in just over a year. I just mentioned how this was the second longest legal document. It is quite amazing at how quickly it was negotiated from the heads of agreement to that deed of settlement. And then, just under a year later, the third reading of the Naitahu Claims Settlement Bill to enact this formal legislation. And as Rakahia mentioned, we have this photo here of Naitahu Fanui coming up the steps, filling in uh, the parliament chambers. Waiata. Haka resounding out. Finally, the settlement had come to a close. We can see how with this early disagreements and these really slow-moving negotiations, things almost move at light speed in about two years to a final settlement. And it, and it shows the challenges that come with these negotiations, whatever way the political winds are, are blowing effectively. And it shows as well those continuous challenges which exist today in those interactions with the Crown 
and perhaps even the necessity sometimes for court action to force the crown forward. So let's go into our break for a cordero. If you could turn your mics on, uh, turn your cameras on. If you've got any issues, uh, please reach out to tech support. But get your feedback um, into the feedback chat in the main room, please. And there's three questions here. It's not a race. You can choose whichever question you want. If you want to look at all three, kapai. If you only want to look at one, please feel free to do that as well. So first of all, what do you think of the importance of the different parts of the Naitahu negotiating team? How is the Crown's negotiating team different or similar? What do you think of the pressure Naitahu was placed under to make a settlement proposal early in the negotiations? And are you surprised with how poorly the Crown was prepared to begin? And what do you make of Naitahu's litigation strategy during the breakdown? Heaps of other questions and comments around it. Feel free to touch on any issue that we went through here. So we'll take about 10 minutes. At about 9 minutes, we'll, we'll warn you to uh, finish up. And please nominate one person to feedback. I've already seen one piece um, of feedback and a question coming up. So keep them coming. We'll see you soon. Uh, thank you. Kia ora. So thank you so much. If people could feel free to keep putting in different feedback there. Oh, there we go. It's coming up now. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, any kind of comments, any kind of feedback uh, is more than welcome. And just a reminder, we're going to be finishing up uh, about a half hour earlier today. So that was our, our only sort of breakout session. And But we will have some Q&A time at the end as well, if there are more certainly more questions that come up whether from the first half or even about the contents of the settlement uh, that I'm going to go through for the second half. So we've got some comments and some questions uh, from Chris uh, Brosnahan. The estimate from CS First Boston of 20 billion for projected losses, is that report available online? I don't believe it is at the moment, but with the amazing work done over at the Naitahu Archive uh, with the team there, I'm sure it wouldn't be something out of the question that could perhaps appear in the near future. Even the Crown's own estimates, though, were really, really high. Uh, and it shows really a whole bunch of agreement between these different financial advisors. And CS First Boston, that was the firm for which Stephen Jennings was working, and I think Richard Mead as well. Uh, Credit Suisse First Boston doesn't exist anymore. It's been split up into a whole bunch of different investment firms, or it's got a different name now. But just shows you what kind of expertise is necessary there. Chris also mentioned, despite the 170 mil not being full compensation, the relativity bolt, bolt-on was a good outcome, still paying dividends today. 100% agree with you there. Mark Scott saying, wondering if you could revisit how the process of funding the claim from the Naitahu side worked, please. Certainly there was huge, huge challenges when it came to funding. Fisheries was actually a massive funder, uh, something I was educated about relatively recently by uh, Tatipani over the last few years. And the importance of talking about fisheries uh, in that last workshop and, and certainly in a, needing more of it to understand that fishery settlement, you had a whole lot of funding uh, coming through from quota, the land bank, that land bank where you could put in properties into the land bank, take them out, on sell them, then put in some more because there are so many properties in the in the Naitahu Takiwa. So there was barely any funding at all from the Crown. It had to be, the funding that came from the Crown was taken out of the settlement. This was something that was changed. It was the same for Wakaro Tainui, but currently, and in the last couple decades, you know, claimants have not been charged for their negotiations. There's huge different aspects of funding going on, certainly. Even just one comment that has popped up here from Nathan, 
I understand some people even mortgage their homes to help fund Tekareme. I would not doubt that at all. The funding which went into over the generations, fundraising for people who were in an incredibly difficult position. You know, some senses people starving from night to night, putting their funding to, towards Tekeremi. Um, so certainly the, the mortgaging of properties would have certainly occurred as well. Now just a couple more questions and, and we'll get on uh, and still obviously come back for our last Q&A. From Kore Tombs, the crown appear more divided and unprepared for the negotiations. A really good point. <laughs> they are incredibly divided, no idea what's going on. Now you could say, why weren't you more prepared? Well, as we've seen, the late 80s was moving very quickly, all the judicial decisions occurring in favor of Māori and Naitahu and, and other groups. Now, the Crown might have said, give us a few years, we need to figure out what's going on. Well, certainly Naita, who would have opposed that. No, let's talk right now. Um, so it was, in some tiny way, you could say the Crown was between a rock and a hard place with how unprepared it was. doesn't give it an excuse, but just to provide some context for it. But they were also not surprised by how unprepared the Crown negotiating team was at the outset nor the strategy to force a settlement early on. Uh, these are further indications of just how far off the mark they were and how determined Naitahu were to push the boundaries. Now, just a final couple comments from James Wood. One, it was somewhat unclear what the purpose of the negotiating structure was and particularly how the Crown resourced their teams through all the different votes, basically. <laughs> Now, in terms of the negotiation structure, this big meeting thing, right, with these huge board, um, boardroom tables, I don't think it was particularly productive. It was something that Waikato Tainui actually dropped relatively early in their negotiations. It's always important to still be face-to-face. -face. So I think that was really important for Naitahu. That they'd say, oh, you know, maybe these big boardroom meetings aren't working very well. Well, at the same time, it's important to always have them in the room, even if you're not making any progress. To Naitahu, it was always important. Keep them in the room. Keep the pressure on. And a final comment from James Wood, it seems really unfair to ask Naitahu to propose the settlement when it effectively means that the Crown can constantly just say, no, that's not acceptable. Try again without any further explanation. An incredibly, incredibly challenging. One more quick comment just came up from Kore Toombs' group that the litigation strategy was excellent, patient, firm, and well-organized from the outset. The government appeared attacked and divided upon many fronts, along with the Waitangi Tribunal itself being challenged. And Rakahia just reminded me during our break there, you know, I didn't list all of the litigation. I think it was mentioned about 23 different pieces of litigation at various different points, not just involving the Crown. You also had different litigation involving uh, the tribes to the north in Tetauihu, for example. So a huge, huge litigation strategy, I should say, only providing a little piece. Kapai, thank you so much for that feedback. And, and feel free to get those questions coming uh, as this final session is progressing because we're going to jump pretty directly into a Q&A. And let's move in to discussing some of the settlement contents. The settlement addressed a whole range of issues. I won't be able to touch on every single aspect of the settlement and dive, uh, dive deeply into each part of the settlement. Uh, for example, just off the top of my head, I don't think I've noted uh, dual place names here. Uh, th there could be some other aspects as well. Uh, it's not to say that I don't think they're important. These are just the ones that I've tried um, and chosen effectively for our purposes today. So this isn't the be all and end all, but it is certainly something that will hopefully review some key, key aspects. All treaty settlements effectively have three different categories of redress. 
you have the apology redress, financial redress, and cultural redress. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the Naitahu settlement was incredibly precedent setting. The Wakaro Tainui Ropatsu settlement effectively only had apology redress and financial redress. There was no cultural redress at all. Wakaro Tainui settled its river claims in 2010, and it's currently negotiating, I think finalizing its negotiations over the West Coast harbors. So you could see while Wakaro Tainui benefited from splitting up its settlements and perhaps reaping that financial whirlwind out of it, Naitahu had to have it all in one. And in that way, Naitahu's settlement was perhaps even more precedent-setting than the Wakaro Tainui settlement, which only occurred a year before. So let's go through some of these different forms of redress. I begin at the top with the Crown Apology and the Apology Redress. This isn't the most important redress to everybody, but it's something that was very important to many. The apology was delivered by Prime Minister Jenny Shipley. It's actually somewhat of a shame that Bolger was rolled by Shipley when he was overseas, as it occurred in 1998, because Bolger was so deeply involved. The recommencement of the negotiations, huge, huge efforts by Bolger in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, intimately involved in those negotiations. Graham and O'Regan were certainly not seeing eye to eye for quite a long time, and so it was important for Bolger to come in to sort of break some of those deadlocks. Nonetheless, important that the apology was delivered by the Prime Minister. Naitahu wanted to have the apology delivered by Queen Elizabeth II, just as Waikato Tainui had received their own apology from the Queen. For Naitahu, they had been sending people to fight various wars for king, queen, and country for over a century, supportive of the crown, never taking up arms. And so they thought if Waikato Tainui was going to receive an apology from the Queen, well, Naitahu better darn well, too. This was not something that was available and on the table at the time. But an apology from the Prime Minister is quite rare in these treaty settlement negotiations. There have been a few examples, but if the Queen wasn't available, certainly the Prime Minister was at the top, at the top of that political totem pole. Now, the apology redress consists of a historical account setting out this very strange public history, an unbiased account, completely unemotive, very plain language setting out the relations between Naitahu and the Crown leading up into the actual apology and the settlement. So you have the historical account for the context. The Crown then makes its acknowledgments of the wrongs it has committed. And finally, you have the apology delivered. As we can see here, and as I'm sure many of you know, and perhaps we're in a, live in attendance, Prime Minister Shipley delivered the apology at Onuku, outside of Akaroa, in 1998. And a clip of it is available online on the Naitahu website, so I, I encourage you to, to have a watch of that. As I mentioned, the apology can have less importance for certain people. Some people think that it's completely ungenuine. Is the crown really sorry, or is it just doing this to get out of its liabilities? There's a whole bunch of different views, but you can't deny the importance you know, when it's delivered. Certainly, the appearance of the apology in written form um, at, at Terunanga on Naitahu, and I have not visited, had the, the fortune of visiting every single Whare Nui at the various marae around the Naitahu Rohe, but the many that I have visited, I can see it uh, put up there front and center.
So the apology, what kind of importance does it have? It certainly varies from place to place. But you would say overall that the apology did did merit some, some importance. And I'd be really keen for your own thoughts and your own feedback uh, to put into the, to the comments and into the Q&A. So let's move into the financial redress now. $170 million quantum laid down in the fisheries settlement, also in the Waikato Tainui Ropatu, $170 million is the maximum that is available. As we'll see, this is not adjusted for inflation. Something particularly cheeky, I would say, on the Crown's behalf. So $170 million yesterday is worth more than $170 million today, or in fact tomorrow. What this shows is the incredible pressure, which is not only Naitahu, but all the claimants that came after Naitahu are under to settle. Because the sooner you settle, the more value you will have. And this, I think, is something incredibly unfair. Now, for all the genius and money that exists at Treasury, somebody certainly messed up. And that was the idea that they wouldn't want to pay these out all at once, which is just absurd. Think of any year's budget, $170 million is a drop, a drop in the bucket. But because of Treasury's concerns at the time, they wanted it to be paid out over five years. And so Naitahu said, great, well, you're going to be paying interest on that unpaid sum. We haven't quite reached the OCR that was in place back, back in the late 90s. You can see there, 8.87. If I was doing this lecture a few months ago, we'd still be laughing at our 0.25 OCR that was in place. But things have changed. Things have changed in the last few months. And hopefully we don't reach that 8.87 for many other reasons. But for Naito, it was wonderful strictly for the interest payments. I don't know the exact sum, but it's somewhere between 20 to $25 million, which was received in those interest payments, right? Think of dividing 170 by five, those first interest payments you know, on hundred something million dollars at 8% were, were quite substantial. So perhaps somebody at Treasury got fired for that one. Now other aspects, key issues, and bolt, part of the bolt-ons, certainly interest payments, part of these bolt-ons as well, I should mention. The fact that the financial redress is so limited, there needs to be some kind of tools available to maximize that amount. And we can see that within the right of first refusal and the deferred selection process. The right of first refusal is what it sounds like. Naitahu has the first right to purchase crown lands when they come up for privatization. Now there's some people listening in, um, certainly from the Kaimahi side, uh, but perhaps even from Naitahu Fanui, I do believe that these are not sold at a market price, that there is some type of arbitration that takes place. But I'm very happy to be corrected uh, upon this point. So the right of first refusal, incredibly helpful in place for many, many years. If the right of first refusal was something that was used to maximize you know, the limited financial redress for crown lands that wanted to be privatized, the deferred selection process was a bit different. The DSP was in relation to lands which the crown was willing to sell, but which on which it would remain as a tenant. We're talking about schools, talking about courthouses could even be talking about jails, other, other forms of crown assets where the crown wants to remain as a tenant. And the DSP was incredibly valuable because it provides a sound cash flow. What you get is, luckily in our case, we're not, we're not a bit crazy and different like the Americans. Our budgets pass year to year. The crown is a wonderful tenant. It pays market rates. 
And in this sense, the DSP becomes a very sound cash flow. And in other ways, the RFR and the DSP were really important for providing a Naitahu footprint in Otautahi, in Christchurch. When the earthquakes came, we weren't, Naitahu weren't just mana whenua, uh, not to say that that's just something, but the Crown and local government, as we well know, can ignore mana whenua. But it was very importantly a fee simple title holder, right? An owner of property. And this was incredibly important uh, for making Naitahu one of you know, the three key parties involved in the reconstruction. In the DSP, you can see I've written there that an additional 80 million on top of the 170 million was allowed to purchase DSP properties. This doesn't mean that the Crown provided $80 million of quantum in addition. They certainly did not. What this meant was that Naitahu could raise its own funds. And wouldn't you believe it, the banks were lining up to lend to Naitahu after ignoring them for many, many years. And even in the early 90s, in the late, in the late 80s, winding up some of its bank accounts the Bank of New Zealand, some of the advertisements which are out there today uh, make me chuckle a little bit when you see how Naitahu were treated by the banks before they became you know, so financially uh, valuable. But in this case, certainly the banks were willing to lend. And so what this meant isn't that Naitahu could just purchase any property it wanted that the Crown owned. There was a specific list of properties. And here you had a $400 million list of properties worth of assets, and $250 million could be purchased. So you'd have to leave $150 million on the table. One of the key properties that Naitahu had wanted was certainly power-generating properties. Mahinga Kai inland lakes. I was just reminded by Dr. Hia, these ECNZ properties, the Electricity Corporation, a very big target, not available. You might understand from the Crown's point of view why it wouldn't provide those, but it'd be just as important to understand why Naitahu would. So the DSP, another important, important aspect now, a final piece of the financial redress that I'm going to discuss today is the Relativity Clause. And, and from the comments um, that I was being provided, uh, we can see some understanding already uh, of the value that came out of the Relativity Clause, this very important bolt-on. The Relativity Clause, as most of you might know already, was meant to maintain the value of the Naitahu settlement in relation to the Crown's proposed total amount that it would spend. I mentioned 94-95 summer, huge backlash to the Crown's fiscal envelope. Well, this is that $1 billion that was originally set by the Crown, that that's how much they would spend on all negotiations. Once again, you can see a treasury number pulled out of thin air. They literally spent two years trying to figure out those treaty settlement policies, and they landed on just this round figure of one billion. A little bit absurd um, from my point of view. So if the Crown was only going to spend a billion at this time, then Naitahu said, whatever our piece of that billion dollar pie is, it must remain the same. So every dollar that the Crown spends over a billion well, Naitahu is going to receive its 16.1%. Now, why was it 16.1% rather than 17? Well, it comes back to that adjustment for inflation. And you can see I've said the $170 million for Wakara Tainui in the fourth quarter of 1994. By the time we come to the third quarter of 96 at the heads of agreement, it's only worth $161 million. So you can see about 18 months took out about $9 million worth of the value. 
Now, we've seen how interest payments made up for that, certainly, and certainly the Relativity Clause did uh, in the hundreds of millions that have already been received, and, and further, court action which is being taken to make sure that the Crown is revealing what's going on in its books. Uh, we can see that there's long-running negotiations going on over that as well. That 16.1% Relativity Clause, incredibly important. So let's turn towards the cultural redress now. And once again, I can't touch upon everything, but what we'll look to touch upon is, um, as much as we can, certainly. Fee simple title without a marginal strip for those Crown Titi Islands and Rarotoka Island. And we can see there in this map image some of those islands that were known as the Crown Titi Islands. We talked about how during the Rakiura Purchase, the Crown was meant to preserve all of the Titi Islands, but it only reserved some, became known as the Beneficial Titi Islands, and then we had the Crown Titi Islands. The return of the Titi Islands was a non-negotiable aspect of these negotiations. It was not going to happen, right? You had to have the Titi Islands and so the return of these without a marginal strip was something that took a very long time to fight for. The Department of Conservation, Forest and Bird, all types of conservation groups, public access advocates, really foul racism coming out of some of these places too. And, and I was quite surprised when I was doing this research, seeing at how a lot of these so-called greenies, these conservationists, even our last Minister of Conservation, Eugenie Sage, was working for, uh, not the current one, 2017 to 2020, was working for Forest and Bird, was strong opponents of the Naitahu settlement, delayed redress being negotiated. You, th you know, I've talked about how Treasury and the Crown Law Office could be a well-paying, the Department of Conservation and these conservation groups were, in some cases, almost solely responsible for breakdown in discussions, for something not being negotiated. So the removal of these marginal strips, these queen chains, to Naitahu there was no way that you could be returning land and taking it away in the same fell swoop. It didn't make any sense. Rarotoka Island as well, which we can see to the north of Rakiura, a key staging point, important Urupa, Rarotoka Island, I mentioned, had been mentioned, I had mentioned that it had been included in this interim settlement that was proposed with the marginal strip. So it was very important to receive that without as well. Fenua Ho, Codfish Island, also sought in fee simple, wasn't possible. There are trade-offs which have to be made. And so only a co-management role was received at Fenuaho, but one that is still incredibly valuable. And here, uh, just some photos of Rarotoka and one of the Titi Islands, Timore. Wonderful, beautiful photos uh, provided uh, by Terunaga Onaitahu. Amazing photos uh, made from the air. But we can see the importance for Rarotoka Island. There was not only this marginal strip, I believe there was also a blue water tidal, that is the foreshore and seabed, very uniquely, was also transferred there. And you can see um, the, the area around uh, the island. And for Timore, the Titi Islands, we can see the absurdity of the crown trying to maintain a marginal strip there. Right, where are you even putting it? These Titi Islands generally cliff, cliff faces along the side. There's gonna be nobody coming through there. You even had the audacity of forest and bird and different tramping groups claiming, how would they go tramping onto these islands if they didn't have these marginal strips? So you had just, just absurd, absurd commentary to try and prevent some of this redress. Now, we also had 
64 statutory acknowledgments and deeds of recognition. And you can see I've set them out there on that map. Most of the major rivers and many of the key lakes around the Naitahu Rohe. Now, statutory acknowledgments provide Naitahu for some more of a say in resource consent processes, right, under the RMA. Resource consent uh, institutions, ECAN, for example, must have regard to the views of Naitahu. Notifications must be provided to Terunanga o Naitahu, to Papa Te Perunanga. But this does not provide a right of veto. It's not to say that statutory acknowledgments have no use at all in them. And to be frank, they were quite advanced for the time. And most treaty settlements, except for perhaps Whanganui River and Waikato River settlements, which are both incredibly unique, and there are many other settlements that still have these statutory acknowledgments today. Deeds of recognition over the same areas as, a, as those statutory acknowledgments, rather than for resource consent processes, these are mainly related to, to dock lands, to the Department of Conservation lands, uh, where Naitahu, if at any point anything is occurring with the management of that land, is also involved. And this is some of the effect of this deed of recognition. 14 Topuni reserves in relation to dock lands, again, but this is more in relation to the information provided there uh, when you visit these dock areas. There's a topony, for example, uh, on the way out to the west coast. Um, the name escapes me at this time. Uh, limestone karst areas on the way out. But as one example of, of a topony reserve, just more information to be provided and more control over the narratives over these dock lands. Now you had the return of approximately 50 discrete parcels of land as well to Naitahu individuals. These were the ancillary claims. Incredibly challenging, uh, those returns, I believe still to this day. But this was perhaps only a few million dollars worth of land, but that was provided and not charged against the Naitahu settlement. This was an important aspect, a final aspect of the negotiations. We also have the return of Ponamu. All naturally occurring Ponamu in the Naitahu Takiwa through the Ponamu Vesting Act, 1997. And this return of Ponamu, just like the Tsitsi Islands, was a non-negotiable aspect. It had to be provided. And certainly there was litigation involved when the licensing continued. And there was myriad challenges to come, certainly in the years after, and still to this day, with policing the theft of this amazing Taonga and resource. What we've got there is also the return of some Taonga. It's part of many treaty settlement negotiations that pretty much the only way you can get Tonga back from museums is, in some cases, un unless it's ko'iwi, unless it's actual bodily remains, trying to get actual Tonga back is incredibly difficult. Uh, but you had the return of some of these so-called Shortland ponamu that were allegedly provided to Edward Shortland, although I know that there's a whole bunch of confusion over whether they're in fact were received by Shortland, but this is one of the examples. And I know some of them are on display uh, at the entrance to Terunaga on Naitong. So the return of Ponamu, of all naturally occurring Ponamu, was, was quite important. The creation of the Waitaiki Historic Reserve in the Arahuta Valley also meant to accompany some uh, of this wider redress regarding Ponamu. You had the return of very small amounts of dock lands. You can see there 1,567 acres, not even a drop in the bucket. as a fraction of a drop in the bucket uh, 
when you think of the millions of acres of dock lands. This in itself was a huge accomplishment because of this massive opposition from conservationists. Now, Naitahu also was provided with dedicated seats on every regional conservation board in the Rohe and one in each Te Tauihu conservation board. These can be useful in some ways, can be useless in other ways. Some of the difficulties more recently that have been felt by Papa Tipurunanga on Te Tai Pautini on the west coast, some examples of that. Nonetheless, still very important redress. And because of the Naitahu Rohe and the massive size of it, a dedicated seat on the New Zealand Conservation Authority. Now you also had the return of three lake beds, Te Waihora, Muriwai, and Lake Mahinapua. Te Waihora being one of the most important, certainly. The return of lake beds does not mean that you have control over the water, though. This is the best redress which was available at the time, certainly, and we've seen some, some pretty amazing co-management and co-governance regimes established, for example, for Te Waihora. In these settlements, you don't always receive exactly what you want. We've certainly seen that on many levels. But still getting a piece and working its way forward, you can see the importance of the return of these lake beds. Now, we've just got a few, a few more slides to go, and we'll be finishing up. Nohoanga entitlements. We can see the 72 sp uh, spread out on the map there. These Nohoanga entitlements were essentially camping sites up to uh, around one hectare in size around key Mahingakai sites. We're talking about along rivers, along lakes, along the coast. These were established to address the Mahingakai element of the settlement and the claim. The return of three high country stations I mentioned how they were added during the kind of gradual breakdown uh, around these stations around Lake Wakatipu. In the end, the majority of these stations were retired into the conservation estate. This was due to the impact of conservationists, public access advocates that I'd mentioned before. Also, there was a review taking place of pastoral uh, leases which, which these properties were, but Naitahu was the first. And if you think about it, Naitahu's settlement represented a moment in which not only Naitahu received land, the crown increased its own asset base as a result of this Naitahu settlement. These pastoral leases, which were private properties, the large majority under pressure were retired into the conservation estate. Wander at will provisions put in greater than had ever been provided before. Anake Goodall pointed out during his um, submissions and evidence before the Māori Affairs Select Committee when it was making its way through Parliament, the settlement bill, was that he found it quite ironic that you'd have Naitahu treated in a different way because of these perceptions around wander at will provisions that Naitahu wouldn't let the public on. I know that some of those provisions meant that the Crown took on huge liabilities, that if somebody was to have an injury on these high country stations, it would not be the problem uh, of Naitahu. Now we can also see on the map there Tutaipatu Lagoon, just to the north of us here in Otautahi, where, where, we, where I am located right now. Beautiful to Taipatu, returned in fee simple. The entire lagoon, water included, very unique aspect of this settlement. The co-governance regime put in place between Te Runanga Onaitahu and the Waimakariri District Council for uh, Te, te Kohaka o Tuhai Tara Trust that's in place today shows the amazing advances that can be made once Naitahu is put in charge of some of its uh, water assets, of its Wai Māori, 
Tutapatu Lagoon. For those of you who haven't visited, it, it's a must. Perhaps not in this terrible weather that we've got today, but it's so close to us and an amazing, an amazing example um, of co-governance and as well as what can be done um, through Naitahu ownership in Naitahu Rangatiratanga. And finally, I finish with the return of Auraki. This was meant to be returned for seven days with immediate gift back. Once again, I'm more than happy to be corrected not only on this, but on anything else that arises here. But from what I was told and what I have known is that it has yet to be gifted back. And I quite like to finish there because it shows you the ways in which, the little ways that at least the claimant groups, the Naitahu in this case, can try and control just a little bit of this redress. Try and control a little bit of what the crown is doing and attacking, perhaps in some ways, the crown's kawanatanga, right? Its governance power, whether that's through litigation strategies, whether it's through using this forms of redress in different ways. We can see that the return of Auraki, perhaps we're waiting for different management regimes put in place, legal personality being provided for Maunga soon at Taranaki. It would also be there um, for Naruhoi, Ropehu in the central North Island, and certainly it had been done for Te Uruwe. So you never know what is to come in the future. As I mentioned, we couldn't touch upon every single different piece of redress on offer. But hopefully we've, we've touched upon many of the more important aspects. There's always more to be learnt uh, regarding these negotiations. Certainly, if, uh, if people are interested, I do go into some more detail in a long time coming. The Naitahu website as well, Te Whakataunga, uh, but as well as the general Naitahu website goes through in some detail too uh, throughout the settlement and dealing with the different settlement contents. So if you are interested, please have a look. These negotiations, I'm hoping you can see, were incredibly difficult for Naitahu. Facing off against the crown was never going to be easy. It consumed the lives of negotiators. It consumed the lives of Fanau, of Hapu, of the, of the Iwi. In many ways, I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy to be a treaty settlement negotiator because of the pressure that is placed upon you, the, the pressure that is placed upon all. And so hopefully we can get a little bit of a taste of what that was. And ultimately, all of those different, um, all of those different aspects of the settlement negotiations, the compromises that must be made, certainly, uh, are are apparent beyond everything. Kia ora. We will do some Q and A now. If the people who have comments or questions, please get them through, uh, and we can. We can do um, for, for certainly for some minutes, and uh, and I'll also get Rakahia to come up, and perhaps as well to provide uh, some some commentary and some feedback too. Certainly, I, I thank you, Martin. That was a fantastic presentation, and um, I said to Martin earlier during our conversation that. He um, watered so many seeds of uh, memory, and um, he would say something, and it uh, opened up a whole lot of other um, lost memories. So thank you for doing that, and uh, we may be able to look at uh, extending your book, as you indicated to me, uh, and some of the narrative in that book. Um, I'd just like to refer to one of the questions during uh, the presentation, and that was around the valuation report. Uh, completed by uh, Credit Suisse, or I'm not too mm, sure it was mm, Capital yes, yep. at the time. Uh, we do have that report. Um, but certainly during uh, the negotiation periods, that report was very confidential, uh, amongst others, but um, uh, we will um, think about whether we publish it or not. We'll just have to go through a process and if we put it online. So we've got... Um
a couple of questions. I don't know if I'm able to answer those in specific detail, but from Aroha Rikas, uh, Tena Tato, the Upoko of Arofenua signed one day after receiving Auraki um, back to the crown. So perhaps that's indicating um, whether Auraki was returned back. Uh, it was something that I'm, as I mentioned, I'm more than happy to be proven incorrect on. Um, from Emma Forrest, what is the reason for the gaps in the coastline statutory acknowledgement? I think it's because it, I could be, oh, oh I heard Arofenua refused to hand back. Sorry, going back to, um, to that uh, question regarding Auraki. Yeah, I, Chris Brosnahan is pointing out there because it's tupuna, uh, Tipuna. Now, in terms of the gaps in the coastline statutory acknowledgements, I think it's covering that, that, that gap in it um, covers all of that coastline so that if there's any resource consent processes doing it out to a certain number of kilometers out into the coast, I don't know if I'm <laughs> interpreting that question quite correctly. So um, pl please do um, clarify, Emma, um, if, if that is something that I haven't. Now, Chris uh, Brosnan is also saying there's a lot of pushback about co-governance at the moment. I think that's a bit of an understatement, but certainly. Do you have any comment given the success of the Naitahu experience with some of the Wai Māori on co-governance? I mean, I'm probably the wrong person to ask that because I'm supportive of it. And I think what we're seeing around the country is this, I mean, classic Pākehā obsession with control. I, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, you can see National saying that it's going to repeal Three Waters um, if it comes into power. I think, and I think that's it's not out of the question, certainly, that National is going to win this next election. How do we deal with the pushback about co-governance? I don't think it's as simple as people, the elderly dying off. It's only them that are the most racist or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the solution really is here. Uh, it's, it's something that's really concerning that it feels like we've taken a whole lot of steps back when I felt like we had some, taken some steps forward. But I wonder if, if Rocky here, if you, if you want to comment at all on what those kind of challenges and how do you, how do you deal with with what's to come in terms of that co-governance. This is an intergenerational uh, continuation of uh, uh, dating back many years. And if I go back to the apology, um, I know during that time, uh, during the negotiations uh, around that apology, which my uh, brother wrote, uh, there was a lot of discussion around rangatira tanga. So if you start at that point, and I know that's not the starting point, but it's one starting point, and think about rangatiratanga at that point in time. It's been an ongoing uh, uh, battle. Uh, and I think, uh, certainly for myself and the future uh, generations, we will have to continue on with uh, the interpretation and the rights that go with rangatiratanga and what that looks like in, in a, today, but also for future generations. So that's going to be an ongoing uh, kaupapa for us. Uh, mm. In terms of uh, water, uh, as you will know, we've got litigation in front of the courts, so I don't want to, or rather, uh, not litigation, uh, a declaration on Ngaitahu Rangatira Tanga over water. So that's one of the examples where we will be seeking uh, defining what Rangatira Tanga looks like. Mm. Uh, so it's an ongoing kaupapa. Yeah, I think the, the co-governance question, I mean, if we look at Tutaipatua, okay, it's a small area, um, but there's farms all around it. You know, there's all types of challenges. I know that there was, you know, issues around drainage, you know, quite late in the piece. Um, perhaps there still are. I, I'm not privy to, to the co-governance, you know, day-to-day -day that occurs at Tutaipatu today. But I think there are so many positive examples it's, it's, it's slightly bewildering that uh, 
you feel like you take the nation takes many steps forward and then takes a number of steps back at the same time and it's it's a bit of a nauseating dance in in some ways um, I'm sure for many Look, co-governance isn't the end point. Um, rangatira tanga is, which isn't necessarily co-governance. So I think if we we are looking at uh, rangatira tanga and we are making the decisions, uh, co-governance I think comes about as part of the treaty partner relationship where we sit across the table as uh, co-governors and treaty partners. That's one form of rangatira tanga. Ngaitahu is a treaty partner exercising its rights, its interests, and its view of the world. Um, and then we come back to Ngaitahu and say, uh, we are rangatira, and this is how we exercise it. And that by uh, might be uh, in whole, rather than just a, in partnership. Mm. <coughs> and just to, just the last piece, just to clarify, thank you so much, Emma uh, and Nathan. Um, you were saying much of Te Tai Potini, uh, and a bit of the southern Canterbury coastline look to be excluded mm from the coastal statutory acknowledgement area. I, I don't know why that occurred. Um, I'll try and look into some of that, um, but it's a really, it's a really important question uh, as, as to why those particular areas were, were perhaps um, excluded. Now, just before um, I ask um, Rakahia uh, to close for us uh, with a karakia, uh, thank you to everybody for, for coming uh, in today and just looking ahead uh, to next month's workshop to be held on the 11th of August on our regular Thursday and we're going to be focused in on the establishment of Te Runanga o Naitahu and the fight for a legal personality so I hope that will be of, of something of interest um, to everyone out there um, ka kite and you know, please go <laughs> Kia tau, kia tātou katoa, te atawhai o tō tātou āriki, uh, me te aroha o te atua, me te whiwhinga, takinga tanga ki te wairua tapu, āke, 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 āmene.